We fewer gamers, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that rolls his dice with me shall be my brother. Uh, maybe just my cousin, but somebody related to me in some in some ways because that's the way where gamers are. They uh, they argue all the time against each other, but after all there is a sense of community. We Happy Few is a game about the Battle of Agincourt. It is a, a game in a new line called Tiny Battle. Uh, it is a game, is a line of games uh, that is uh, suitable for beginners, so low complexity, low number of counters, so small board. The game also comes in a Ziploc bag. And this game in particular, in this new line, has to do with Agincourt. A phenomenal important and interesting battle from the historical point of view. Um, a battle that is the subject of a now classic study by John Keegan. I study this very often in my classes about warfare, so it is always great for me to have games about Agincourt that I can potentially play with my students after we talk about the battle and we read the essay by Keegan. But it is also a battle that is very hard to turn into an interesting and fun game, uh, just because of the way the battle was. It is very interesting because it shows two complete completely different approaches to warfare and how uh, one of them completely dominated the other, even in the face of superior numbers uh, on the other side. We have, as you know, everybody knows, the English and the French, we are in the Middle Ages, uh, late Middle Ages, and the uh, English are defending in an area surrounded by trees, so that creates a little bit of a tunnel where the French that are attacking are forced to come. The French are coming in vastly large numbers with powerful cavalry, and the English are using longbow, but they had the advantage of, well, precisely, of having long range, of having long range attack against incoming cavalry. They have a better position. The terrain is helping them. They prepared some temporary fortifications using spikes. So, we know what happened historically that the French were sorely bitten. In this game, uh, the French player will take a lot of damage, as it is necessary to have a game about this topic, but there are victory conditions that allow the French player to win the game, even though the French player will technically lose the battle. Let me show how the game works, though. This is the map of the game. It is a pretty small map, printed on paper, folded in two as it comes out of the Ziploc bag. The game doesn't come in a box. Pretty small, but this is a small game. Here you have the area of the confrontation. The British player will set up here, uh, behind these protections here, the spikes that they used to protect uh, the longbow and the few infantry units that the English player has. And here you have an area indicated by these symbols here to represent the setup area for the French player. Units in the game are represented by these counters here. They represent the infantry, some archers for the French player, but most of the archers belong to the English player some cavalry. Really what matters in this game when you're looking at the counters is the inf is the illustration that tells you the type of unit that the unit uh, that the counter represents and a letter here that indicates the quality, uh, the class of the unit. Also as you can see there's an indication here that says disrupt. So when a unit takes a hit it is disrupted so you turn it by 90 degrees to indicate that status. Orientation in this game only matters for purposes of disruption. If a disrupted unit takes a hit you flip it to the other side and it looks the same but it has a white band here. Let me uh, show you on another counter where you can see the white band better. There is a white band here that simply indicates that the unit is reduced and also the unit has a disrupt a disrupt uh, side, a disrupt edge. And as you can see the letter, uh, the quality of the unit may go down when the unit is reduced. So we said you, the French player sets up here, we'll try to reach the English position and to inflict pain on those uh, enemies, but alas the English do have their longbow and that means that it's pretty painful to get there. Counters as you can see, as you can saw from my examples, are divided in different colors. The different colors indicate the wing that the unit belongs to, so units are divided in wing. 
and uh, you have activation markers so that at the beginning of each turn you assign to your wing. For example, the units belonging to this wing indicated by counters of this color will receive a certain marker indicating an order that they receive. Um, another wing will receive another order and so on and so forth. Not all units, not all wings necessarily will receive orders at the beginning of the turn. And uh, units, I mean wings, may receive multiple orders but they may not receive more than one uh, copy of the same order. Let's look at the counters representing the orders. You may have move or on the other side you have a double indication. Double indication doesn't mean anything per se, you simply pair it with other symbols. For example, I may have a wing that receives a double and a combat or a double and a move. In case of a double plus move, well yes, the wing that receives that order moves twice. In case of a double combat, the unit may fight twice or may uh, fight a single battle, but it is in that case a pitch battle, which has an advantage for the attacker. And then you have other orders, which also may be modified by the double, but in slightly different ways. An order is rally, that allows you to uh, reorganize units that are disrupt, uh, into a disrupt state. Combat, and another rally. Fire, that means a range attack, or horse, which means a special uh, attack, special move and attack that uh, can be performed by cavalry. And then again, we have a double and a move. So you can assign two copies of the same counter to a unit, to a wing, but you cannot assign them uh, as they're showing the same side. So I cannot give a uh, wing two moves that way, but I could do it like this, which pretty much achieves the same. So at the beginning of each turn, each player takes their uh, their uh, orders. Both players have two identical sets of orders, and each player assigns the orders to their, to their units. Also, there's a marker indicating initiative. Uh, the, one, the player starts controlling initiative marker at the beginning of the game. The initiative marker gives you the opportunity at the end of your turn to take a second player turn in a row. After you take your second player turn, you switch uh, control of the initiative. You give the initiative marker to the player, which may later use it in the same fashion and then the marker goes back to you. This can be very useful if the French are arriving and the English player wants to inflict an extra volley of pain and death and destruction on the on the approaching French with uh, the longbow or the opposite uh, complementary situation the French player wants to perform a final push against the uh, English longbow to inflict finally uh, some hits that will reduce that mighty fearful defense but that's how it works you assign the orders to your wings and then you simply will go through the turn uh, the turn will show you the order the turn order shows you the order in which the action phases are resolved which is in which the orders are resolved you simply go through this list and when it gets to a phase if you have an order or more than an order in that phase you simply perform the action indicated by that phase uh, the rally phase if you have a rally order that allows you to roll a die dies are not included in the set you need to provide your own you roll a die, and the number that you roll is the number of disrupted units that you're able units that you're able to reorganize. If you have a double rally, then you simply reorganize all units in a wing. The fire phase allows you to perform fire combat. We'll talk about that later. The horse phase allows you to move and to charge. That is to perform a powerful attack with your uh, cavalry. You have then the move phase. <clears throat> Units in this game usually move by three spaces on the board and when you are moving you simply move from one hex to the other of course uh, but enemy units do have zones of control that is you do need to stop when you move adjacent to an enemy uh, to an enemy uh, unit that is one of the six hexes adjacent to that unit you have to stop your movement is over for that turn but um, you may be able later if you decide to move to move away as long as you're not moving directly into another zone of control
Now, an important thing about movement. The English archers project an approach zone, we should really call it a death zone, that extends four axes away from the unit itself in all directions. When enemy units enter the approach zone or death zone and move through it, they will receive damage. This is an actual way to simulate the rain of arrows that the English archers, the English longbow, are producing and also the slowing effect of the Mediterranean in that fateful day. When a unit enters the first hex of an approach zone, if the unit is not disrupted, nothing happens. If the unit enters a second hex in the approach zone, or it is the first hex in the unit was disrupted, then the unit incurs in a hit. And remember, hits means that you, if you are undisrupted, you become disrupted. If you are disrupted already, you become uh, reduced. And if you are reduced already and disrupted, you are eliminated. So basically, starting from the first or the second hex of the approach zone that a French unit enters, uh, the unit will start taking hits, which means it's scientifically impossible for a unit to simply move from the outside of the approach zone to the approach zone itself without being annihilated. What happens is that you'll move there, you'll be severely reduced, and then you will rally and then little by little slowly slowly you will make your approach um, which may seem silly may seem like well then it's uh, the longer you stay here move move rally move rally move rally the the slower you move, the safer you are. But in reality, then remember, this is only movement. This is uh, this is punishment that you take during movement, because then you also have a combat phase when the uh, English longbow can fire. You can simply use the regular attack. The approach zone effect is in addition to the uh, English regular attack. So if you are moving slowly in the approach zone, you are. Uh, minimizing the effects of the approach zone but then you're staying uh, in front of the English and being a viable target for the English longbow for longer which is still pretty devastating. So what happens for intents and purposes is that you have the movement phase in which the French unit gets reduced uh, considerably during the approach phase then during the combat phase the longbow start inflicting the giving the, the final the final hit uh, the coup de grace to the french units and so you start seeing holes in the french line another french line approaches and repeats the process of getting reduced and then slaughtered killed murdered uh, usually before reaching the english line it's very tough for the french to reach the english line as it should be historically of course but back to us, to the mechanics. Suppose that finally you have made it to attack enemy units. Yay, hooray. Now it is time to fight. Oh, and then I don't remember if I said this, but um, we are talking about the movement phase. After the movement phase, you had the five phase when you perform uh, range attacks with the active unit that received a fight order. And then uh, you have the uh, first combat phase when the active player with a combat order may declare combat and then you may have if the unit has two combat orders a double combat order you may have a second combat phase or you may have instead a pitch battle which is when a double combat order is used for a single combat now talking about combat when you are declaring combat, you are uh, you may have multiple units attacking a single enemy unit, but in that case you still have to declare uh, which of your units is the main unit, the primary unit, and the other unit or units participating to the attack uh, are simply supporting. They uh, give you a bonus. Now, first thing to do to resolve combat once you declare your attack is to determine the class, the actual class. Of course, the class of the attacking unit is printed on the counter, but it may be modified by circumstances. For example, your combat receives a plus one class, so from B to A. For example, if your target is disrupted or if you and or if you are in a pitch battle. <clears throat> 
there's the advantage of uh, investing a double combat in a pitch battle. Alas, however, if you are attacking against uh, a hex uh, that is a hex side through a hex side that is protected by the spikes, your class goes down by one. So you determine the actual class or the primary unit. Then next thing you have to do is to determine the modifiers that you will apply to the die roll. For each supporting unit, which is of the same class quality of the primary unit, you will have a bonus of plus one on the die roll that you will perform in a second. For each two supporting units of lower class than the primary unit, then you have plus one to the die roll. Uh, sorry, I meant plus one. So this is confusing. When you're rolling dice, the, the positive things, the good uh, die rolls are minus. So you have a positive meaning that it helps you, meaning that it's an actual minus one. I know it sounds confusing. Look, I'll show it to you. I don't even know if I make much sense at this point. When you have supporting unit, uh, uh, supporting units, uh, uh, you have a minus one to your die roll, but this is good stuff for each participating unit with the same combat class, minus one for each two participating with a lower class. Also, you have a positive modifier, which is a minus, based on the type of weapons that are involved in the combat. You simply use the unit type modifier matrix, cross-referencing uh, the type of attack, the attacker that you're using with the type of defender. Uh, this is something very common in medieval games so to uh, try to capture some of the incredibly vast difference in functionality between different types of units at the time. And so if you have infantry that attacks cavalry, you have a plus one, which is very bad. Or if you're infantry in close combat against the archers you have minus one which is very good when you have your final class and all your modifiers you roll a die you modify the result based on the roll and based on the modifiers that you have you cross-reference and you will have the result which may be uh, uh, that the uh, attacker retreats, the defender retreats, the attacker takes a hit or two hits, or the defender takes hits, or you may have attacker or defender being eliminated. And we already explained how hits work. As for range combat, it works in a very similar way. It simply has a different set of modifiers. You have plus one, uh, which is a good thing when you are rolling for range combat. You get a plus one modifier if you're targeting a horse unit, plus one if the uh, target is disordered, and plus one if you are performing a uh, double fire. And if you roll your die in your range combat during the fire phase and you apply modifiers and you have a result of six or plus, the target suffers a hit. You have a slightly different uh, version of what I just explained with cavalry, but this is pretty much the general idea. Each player assigns orders, resolves them. It is good that you have a lot of flexibility there because you may have a wing doing a lot of stuff, another unit sitting there and waiting for their turn to try to shine. Uh, but you simply alternate player turns, assigning orders and resolving them. And for the French player taking a lot of hits, a lot of pain as you approach the enemy line until one of the players meets victory conditions, which are simply based on victory points. Here you, uh, you gain victory points by eliminating enemy units, uh, nothing else really matters, it is all about butchery in this battle. And uh, you win the game as the as the uh, French player, if you manage to accumulate at least 10 victory points. So you have to kill somebody, you have to inflict at least some damage on the English player, which is extremely tough. Just getting there is tough, when you get there your people are exhausted, are wounded, demoralized. It's exactly how it was historically. So the uh, French player needs to score 10 victory points, the English player needs to score 30 victory points more than the French player. So given the situation, the English player will inflict a lot of damage, destroy a lot of units, and really the player needs to do so because victory for the English player is based on getting a lot ahead of the opponent. It's not an absolute result, an absolute amount of points that you have to earn, it's relative to how the French player is doing. 
but clearly, as you expect historically, a single unit, a single English unit eliminated by the English player uh, doesn't mean much, you need to eliminate a lot, but a single English unit uh, eliminated by a French, the French player is a lot of, it's very significant because the French player doesn't need many victory points to win the game. So this is how the game works, but now, does the game work as a game? Uh, yes and no, it works so well as a simulation, uh, as a very broad simulation, in the sense a simulation that gives you a very large picture and that gives you the main factors. You do feel as you're playing this game that you're looking at an interactive map, one of those maps that you have online, you click and you see the next step of the battle, so things move. Um, you do get a sense of how the battle works, you do get a sense of how lethal the longbow wear as a French player, you do get to experience the gruesome pain of seeing your amazing, powerful, incredible forces that should prevail just being thinned out and then disintegrate into nothing. And if you are lucky, you do get manage. Uh, to get there and try to push and then you're slaughtered there at that point instead of being slaughtered before you're slaughtered later. Uh, very historical, actually as a game to show to my students, to show them how the battle works, this could be a great tool. I see this as a potentially very interesting pedagogical tool. As a game, uh, it could be played by beginner war gamers, it could be a getaway game, but there is this tricky thing that is it's very specific, the topic is very specific, and this is a battle that historically was very scripted. The, the, the initial situation was such that it had forced uh, the two sides to act in a specific way. As you are reenacting the battle, you are reenacting those actions, and those actions are pretty uh, strict, are pretty restrictive. There isn't much that the players can do, there isn't much experimentation that they can do. Uh, the French player will advance, uh, the English player will fire and you will repeat most of the game happens when you see French units that are destroyed on their way to uh, English units. Uh, it will take a long time before you even get to any close combat and you won't have much of that. It's a exactly what you need in a battle about Agincourt, but it is something that does make the experience not an immersive, not an exciting. It feels pretty repetitive, it feels pretty scripted and, and really constricted. There isn't much experimentation you can do, there are any alternative strategies. Um, it is Agincourt. You see the battle, you move the pieces, you make the decisions, but at the end you feel that the situation is such that your decisions won't really matter all that much. Well, in one game it may make you win, another game it may make you lose, but the overall architecture of the experience will present itself in such a similar fashion from time to time. Oh, my daughter Amelia has come to visit. Hi Amelia! Uh, she hasn't played the game yet, I think she will, I don't know, maybe I'll use it with her to introduce her to work gaming. But the point is that the, the experience will present itself in very similar fashion, time after time, making Daddy, it maybe this? not all that, just a second a minute, maybe making this game, um, well, having a very low um, replay value. But I must say, even when we're talking about just a play value, <laughs> By the middle of a game, Daddy. you will feel that pretty much you've seen more or less what the game has to offer. Amanda, would you like to come and say hi to the viewers? What viewers? The viewers of my video, that I'm recording a video. I'm recording a video in which I'm talking about We Happy Few. Have you, have you, pl <laughs> have you played this game, Amelia? No. No, not yet. I don't know if you like it, but I was just telling our friends that it is a game that is good to get a sense of the battle, maybe, Hi, to, expose, maybe to expose students. Hello! Or, Amelia, I need to finish saying something. You can maybe expose students uh, or young people you're trying to teach about the battle, but as for gaming, uh. from the word gaming experience, is one that is a little repetitive and frankly not that exciting, just because of the way the battle plays uh. out. You can have an historical Asian core, or you can have an exciting Asian core. You, it's hard to have both. This game goes for the historical one, which is something that has Hello. merit in itself. It's just not the most exciting game experience that you have. Wait, wait. Ugh. Bye, friends. Say bye to your friends. Bye. Bye. Ugh. Perfect.